Hey everybody, this is LMP Games, and welcome back to episode 5 of our uh, RPG Maker MV uh, plugin development tutorial series. If you're new to, the, uh, new to this series, uh, what it's about is going through and uh, teaching you how to make plugins in RPG Maker MV. Uh, RPG Maker is a game dev engine, kind of like Unity or Unreal, um, except it's a sprite-based uh, 2D um, isometric um, Engine MV and uh, MZ, which are the two latest versions, use JavaScript for the engine language. Um, earlier versions used Ruby, a uh, well, version of Ruby called Ruby Game Scripting System. But the uh, we'll get we'll kind of get into the point of it here in a bit because we got we're gonna restate a couple different things. Um, but uh, from some of the responses from last week's video, or the last uh, last episode, it wasn't last week, but I wanted to kind of go back over, to restate some stuff, clarify some things, and kind of do a reset on what this series is about, what to expect from it, what I expect out of people watching it, and um, kind of talking about different things of that nature. Um, so I think that, based on that, I didn't do a 100% good job on explaining all that in the original initial videos. Um, and we'll probably have to do this every couple of um, episodes just to kind of reset a couple, reset things so people just kind of jumping in in the middle of the series. Um, so, what is this series about? So, as stated, it's about plugin development, um, teaching you how to make plugins for RPG Maker MV. Um, and also in gener general, also kind of easing you into programming too. So the the kind of skill level that I'm aiming for in terms of um, the initial part of this is something that's kind of either new to both Arpeggio Maker and coding, or has some familiarity with either the first three episodes of this series. Um, kind of go over the basics of Arpeggio Maker, go over the history of the engine. Uh, in part two and in part three, we talk about some really basic stuff um, and some a little more complex topics um, dealing with JavaScript and programming in general. Like, for example, in episode three, we went over uh, basic data types, um, arrays, slash lists, objects, we talked about inheritance, um, we talked about functions, function scope, um, we talked about recursive functions, we talked about um, a scope in general, that's function scope, but talked about um, inheritance, um, encapsulation, and we had a pretty good lengthy section on um, readable uh, and clean, readable and clean code. Um, and that's kind of the, the, that episode was kind of dedicated to those that are new to programming in general, it's kind of going through and learning things so that you can, um, that you could follow along in episode four, where we made the, the current version of the code you're seeing here right now for this plugin. Um, and then what's going to happen is as we go through, we'll be increasing the complexity over X number of videos until we get something that's really complicated, very complex at the end of the series. Now, that said, this is not a tutorial series about how to make specific plugins. Like, you shouldn't come to this and say, oh, I want to do X kind of plugin. Um, here is a plugin that, that sounds like it's what I'm looking for. How do I do this, you know, from step A to step Z? That is not how this uh, series, tutorial series is structured. It's not how it's meant to be consumed. This is a series um, on plugin development as a whole, like teaching you how to actually make a plugin, not how to make specific things. So. The plugins themselves don't matter. They're irrelevant to the to what we're doing. They're just there to kind of facilitate you learning what stuff is, how it works, what you would do, how you would implement it, um, and different ways of implementing something when you wouldn't versus when you would um, implement it that specific way. 
and kind of getting you familiar with the engine, where to find things, and how to um, locate stuff that you might be looking for if you're, you have questions about like how to implement something, or if you like. Um, if you're looking like you're working on let's say a window and you want to know how to do a specific thing Allowing you to like have the ability or give me the, the enough knowledge to know that oh I need to go look at this particular window class or I need to go look at this particular window class And you'll be able to find what you're looking for there um, So, um, one other thing about this series is that um, as we're working through the plugins, we're not going to be writing optimal code. Um, if you have worked on plugins for RPG Maker before, if you've done a lot of coding with JavaScript before, you've probably seen me do some pretty cringe things to now and again. Um, at least in the first couple of videos, those are probably intentionally done that way because I want to introduce a certain concept. Um, later on, it's probably just going to be because, um, in the later ones, it's going to be because we're not actually developing to a plan. Um, it's going to be more of a, a, we have this series of features we want to put in. How do we actually implement them, right? Because we're going to be doing some things that I haven't done before. So I'm also going to be learning along the side of you in some cases. Um, which will be good for you to see as well, because then you'll get like the experience of what I would do to go find things. And then you kind of get an idea of where... Um, you might want to look and how you would try and find information on, on certain stuff. Coding will not be optimal. A lot of, case, a lot of cases at the beginning is going to be intentional to introduce different concepts, different functions of uh, standard functions and things that we haven't covered yet because the first, well the first, uh, well episode three was covering a lot of the beginner stuff and all that. These first three episodes, four, five, and six are also going to be doing some of that as well. Um, so we'll still be introducing new things as we go through these. And because of that, there may be times when I introduce things that are probably a little bit too complicated or too complex. Um, uh, for example, regex. Um, I had a couple of different people comment on episode three that the regex was or episode four that regex was like really complex they didn't really understand that well even after the explanation even after i showed them how it worked um and fair point because i think i probably introduced this a little bit too soon um the reason i introduced it is because i use regex for my plugin commands um, i just find it easier to do than some of the other methods and um because i use regex in my other plugins i use them in all of them because um one of the things I that I have a very huge um, focus on is uh, consistency. So if I do something in one plugin a certain way, then I'm going to do it that way in all my plugins where it makes sense to do it in. Or in the case of plugin commands, I'm just going to use regex in all my plugins because, you know, that's how I do it. In one so I'm gonna do it in the other ones so people looking at my plugins don't get blindsided by some other new kind of thing um, but the main reason I wanted that I wanted to the main, main reason I did this was because I wanted to um, showcase switch so switch uh, the switch is a pretty interesting uh, concept and allows to do some interesting handling of conditions and values and things um, I wanted to showcase it here because we're probably not going to be using it at all in any of the other videos. You don't normally run into cases where you can use Switch really when working with plugins. Um, the only real time I've ever used a Switch was in dealing with uh, keyboard input um, and other things like that. Um, so generally you're not going to be using Switches that much um, and I wanted to just kind of introduce the tool and get people familiar with it. But as a result of that, I implemented, the way I implemented the regex was really complex. I didn't do a very good job of explaining all this stuff either. Um, when we get into some more of the complex uh, videos, we'll talk more about regex at that point. Um, I think I'll have enough time to kind of go through and process this stuff a bit more and kind of get a better understanding if you're doing research on your own um, at that point. But um, just know that this is, regex will be staying. Um, 
We're going to be using it in a couple different places, or in a couple. We're going to be using it in the plugin commands um, uh, for the plugins because it's just what I it's how I do it. But there is a different way to do it. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, first, I want to talk about um, the whole. So what what is consistency? And why do you want to do consistent things consistently? Um, so consistency is one of those kind of parts of writing clean code. Um, if you do something in your code a certain way, it should be done that way throughout all of your code because um, it's a consistent pattern um, and it makes the code more readable than if you do something in five or seven different ways in different parts of your code base. Um, you know, because then you have all these different ways you're handling something that's repeating and in fact probably what you should do is whatever you're doing that's across all those files should be in one place and you should be calling that from that one place um, and reducing that code down because you have a lot of reused code at that point. But um, consistency, one, it gives you more familiarity with what you're doing. So like the more you use regex, the more familiar you get with it. Um, that's pretty much how it was with me. I did not understand anything about regex for the first seven years of me being a, pro, uh, a hobbyist programmer, and I avoided regex like the plague if I could. Um, but then when I got into working with um, developing plugins for MV, all the plugins I was using as kind of looking at and figuring out how they were made and why they were done that way and trying to like duplicate and recreate the stuff they had done to learn what all of it did. Um, pretty much they, all of them used regex for plugin commands. Um, so I just kind of said, you know what, screw it, we're going to learn enough of this and I can use it. And I can probably somewhere in the, like, just above beginner, but not quite the intermediate like, level of mastery of regex. I know enough to write some complicated things, but not enough to really understand all the things or know what ways of implementing the different stuff you can with regex is better than what I did and better than the stuff, the more complex stuff I've used and created. Um, I'm kind of at the phase where I'm, I know enough to be dangerous with regex. Um, uh, but I do definitely can get that for a beginner programmer. Regex is probably looks like some kind of alien language because that's how it was to me uh, originally. Um, this is more of what you would expect to find in plugin uh, command handling. Just simple things where you're looking up a specific like part of a string that you want to bring in. Um, there are, there's another way to do this. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but if you do something some way, you should do it the same way in all of your plugins. Just because it's, you know, they're all your plugins you made. You should have a consistent style through them. Um, makes it quicker for you to write them, makes it easier for people to read them if they're going back through them uh, to try and figure out what you did or to add things to them um, and understand your thought processes and reasoning behind how you did some coding. And it makes it easier when you go back to add things in if you've done things consistently because one, you'll understand why they were done that way because you'll put them in that way a lot. And two, it makes it a lot more readable because they are... It's a consistent style, consistent implementation of a certain process. As opposed to having multiple implementations of it, and then you have to wonder, well, which one's the one that I really want to use? Because um, a lot of times when you go back and look at your old code and you see what you've done in the past, you're going to want to rewrite it or modify it somehow, make it better. Um, at least that's my experience, where I've gone back to stuff I've written not even like two or three weeks in the past and, and thought, like, what the hell was I thinking when I wrote this? Um, especially going back even further, like stuff that I wrote six, seven years ago, look at and say, you know, what the hell is even this <laughs> kind of stuff? Because it's just so poorly written. And in my past self's defense, I know as much as I know now um, about different uh, specific languages. Like back then, I didn't know very much about JavaScript in terms of how things can be used. And it's also changed over the years. Um... Uh, trash can enthusiast, perfect example of this changing thing. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
I was talking with him yesterday about about uh, his experience watching these videos because I wanted to get some more opinions on it um, and kind of try and figure out when I needed to change or if I needed to change anything at all um, based on the feedback people had been leaving in the comments. Um, and he started talking about the fact that he didn't know that there was scoping in JavaScript. Um, he didn't know about let either, like these. Um, when he learned JavaScript, he learned by looking at older code and, and doing older tutorials back in like the early 2010s. Um, and back then, and the code and tutorials we were using were from, you know, four, five, six, seven years ago. And back then, all we had was var. Uh, we didn't have let, so you'd see var used everywhere. Um, the problem is that var has a specific meaning and has a specific way of it that's used. And because of that, um, if you're defining it outside of all your other functions, a var essentially becomes global to the code you're writing. And he, he, was always, he always had problems, he said, with uh, having to clear out variables when reusing them in certain places. Um, when uh, there should be like no value in there and stuff like that. And he always had some like really weird issues that he had to work around. And uh, he figured out that that was because of scoping. And um, the way he was writing the code wasn't actually, you know, the right way to do it. Um, and then when he, you know, saw Let's come up and learn more about it, he's like, well, this fixes all my problems. Um, and he was able to take some code he'd written about four and a half years ago and essentially remove about half of it. Um, because it was all just redundant and not even needed, and was able to, to refactor it quite a bit. Um, once he started thinking a bit differently about how he was coding and why he was coding things the way he was. Um, so, thinking about how you write your code, thinking about ways to reduce the amount of code you're writing, how you can refactor it, thinking about ways to write your code more cleanly, um, more read make it more readable and understandable. Um, the points where you don't need to use comments to describe what's happening because your code documents itself. Um, those are all huge things I am going to be um, pushing throughout this series and have already done so and will continue to do because at the end of all things, if you can't write clean code, uh, you're going to have a hard time maintaining your plugins. People are going to have a hard time reading your plugins. Um, and your plugins are going to have strange issues now and again that cause problems that you'll have to figure out and work around potentially or have to write patches for for uh, for um, to handle uh, incompatibilities of the plugins. You'll probably still need to do that anyway for Power to make your plugins because at some point you're going to have a plugin that's not compatible with yours and either you write a patch to make it compatible or you just say that's not compatible with this plug this plugin and um you have to choose one of the other one to use basically um but there are ways to mitigate some of that by just writing your code a little bit differently a little bit more thoroughly and naming things a bit more appropriately <clears throat> um using trash can again um we're also talking about uh some this current project is working on um, uh, he took a, you see, he took about a five month break or so from it, and when he came back to it, um, to continue working on it, um, he didn't understand anything that was going on in it because he had forgotten all the stuff he had done with it and why he did it the way he did it. Um, but he had written the code in a really dirty, fast way, used abbreviated names, um, all the function names didn't really say what the functions really did. Um, and he had to spend two and a half weeks going back through the code line by line to figure out exactly what was happening. Um, and <clears throat> he said that it was a problem, but he didn't really, you know, it didn't raise any red flags for him. He just thought, well, this is normally what happens. So, I'm, you know, it's just another, another case of this happening. Um, then when I, when he watched the third video, uh, episode three, the last part of that, we were talking about clean code and stuff. He came to the realization that he wasn't writing his code properly. He wasn't writing it cleanly. It, you know, he didn't know what it did when he came back to it. Um, if somebody else read it, it would look like gibberish because he's using a lot of really bad naming conventions. Um, uh, so, you know, again, a little more thought in your code can save you a lot of time later on.
So, let's talk about this plugin. So, um, this plugin that we're making here, this uh, Dialog Selector plugin, is not a one episode plugin. It's actually a plugin we're gonna be developing, oh, developing over three episodes. Um, because I'm gonna ramp up into some more complex topics later on um, and give you more time to kind of absorb all this new information. Um, what's expected is that as you're going through these videos, you're also doing stuff in on your own time. Um, going to JS, going on to JS Fiddle, messing around with stuff, grabbing the code from GitHub for these uh, plugins that we're making, messing around with them in RPG Maker MV, changing stuff, seeing what happens, trying to modify things, um, and kind of getting more familiar with with programming and with JavaScript and plugins in general. Um, these videos are not meant to be like a one-time watch and you're good kind of thing. It's entirely meant that you're going to be watching these multiple times to kind of get all the grasp on all the, the things we're talking about and get a full understanding of what's going on. Um, so, um, to kind of facilitate that, these first couple of episodes, we're going to be just doing dealing with this one plugin, adding things in slowly until we get up to the final state that I want to be in. Um, the main reason that we're doing this is because um, this final state is going to be a proof of concept for a plugin I'm going to write for my game. Uh, so I'm kind of using this as a way to do that. <laughs> so kind of piggyback, I'm piggybacking off of the series to write my own stuff. Um, but what this plugin is, it's so far what it does is it allows you to define some text in a list and that goes into a plugin setting. The plugin setting gets pulled into the plugin from the editor or from the game. Um, and then we take that list and we have some plugin commands that we call to def define which, uh, which text, which dialog in that list we're using. And then that gets stored in a game variable that's then used in the, um, the output and the events in the game to display the text. Um, and that's what the, the current version of this plugin is. So if you look at this, ignore that this is different than uh, the episode 4 version of this. I actually don't have the copy of episode 4's uh, version of this. Um, this is actually not the first time, or even the third or fourth time I'm recording this. Um, I've never gotten past the initial dis discussion of the um, of this stuff or of the um, re-explanation of what the series is about stuff because I've always had, had a bunch of different tangents and um, it's always gone like almost to two hours and I'm trying to get that down a lot and we're actually pretty good time right now we're at about 30 minutes well 25 minutes so I managed to cut a lot of that down <laughs> so the, the the hope is that this video is only going to be about an hour and a half to maybe two hours long and I can get away with either doing a one episode uh, one video episode or maybe just a two video episode and not having to do a full three video episode for this one because we're not going to be doing much like the actual imp what we're going to be implementing will be very quick um, because of how we're going to implement it and um, what that's going to mean in terms of like how the process is going to work so <clears throat> what we're going to be doing in this video is we're going to be changing this plugin, we're going to be enhancing it. We're going to take the dialog list and we're going to convert that to a map. So what a map is, is essentially an object, right? Um, an object in JavaScript is just a key and then a value that is connected to that key. If you use the key, you can get the value from the object. Well, that's how a, conceptually how maps in a lot of other languages work. Um, you have a key, that key is associated with the value. You can use the key to get the value, and then you <coughs> can you know, do more complex things as well. What we're doing with this is we're going, what we're gonna be doing with this is we're gonna be turn, changing it to a map. Um, it's gonna be storing map data. So we're essentially taking our dialog list, we're going to associate the dialog list to an NPC. That NPC is going to be associated to a map and then the map data is what we're going to be storing in the plugin setting now. So we're going to have dialogue for each NPC, and for each NPC on a map, it's going to, they're also going to have dialogue. 
And then if you have multiple maps, each NPC on each map will have their own dialogue as well. So we're essentially expanding out the structure that we're building um, to support adding in NPCs on multiple different maps and those NPCs all having their own dialogue that will be shown. Um, and then we're also going to put in some handling that will allow us to um, uh, prevent a NPC that doesn't exist in a map or a map that doesn't exist uh, from causing any errors. Uh, because the map ID, if the map ID is invalid for some reason, that would cause a, an error if we don't in, put in handling. The NPC ID is invalid for some reason, um, that will cause an error if we don't have any handling in. So we're going to be putting in the handling to handle those situations. Um, other than that, we're not really going to be changing much. Um, the only thing we're going to really be changing is the function that handles the dialogue uh, processing. We're going to be changing the plugin uh, command. And we'll need to add a couple new functions in to handle dealing with the data um, as well. Um, and I will show you why that's necessary here in a second. Let me go ahead and reopen this. One moment. I need to do a few things first. So, um, let's start by um, dealing with the re, uh, configuration of our uh, plugin setting. So, um, we're going to introduce a new type of plugin setting here um, that uh, allows you to deal with a particular situation. So, you can create a plugin setting with a type of note, right? And that note essentially it becomes like what you can do with the note box it allows you to you can actually put in um, like a list notation or you can throw in um, uh, you can throw in um, um, objects into there as well and then have that be imported into the editor the problem with that is that um, Unless you know how to handle the defaults, the like if you're setting the default setting, unless you know specifically how to write the default stuff for that, it can be really complicated and there's a really good chance you're going to end up um, breaking the editor window because it won't be able to be parsed properly. So while using a note, uh, note prop, uh, note um, type uh, parameter is easier, it's actually better to use a struct. Now what a struct is, it's essentially like a class, and but it's not, it doesn't have the same kind of, it's not as, um, you, uh, it's not as many features as a class has. Um, in a lot of languages a struct is basically just um, a basic object that contains data so like you'll have a a variable that has a value um it's a very it's kind of synonymous to what a javascript object is um it just has a key that key is a variable and you can access it through the struct um some languages you can make structs also have functions and some of them you can make them have private and public properties and a lot of languages though it's just a means to um group data together and um, provide a, a type of um, container to store data related to uh, multiple pieces of data related to a, a single thing that's not a and RPG Maker we have a similar thing where we have a struct that we can use to group like, like um, properties together and then allow us to do um, uh, allow us to make essentially a JavaScript object inside of a plugin setting without having to know how to actually properly um, handle um, character escaping to do like a default value um, and also allows you to have um, a lot easier time handling things in the editor um, when you are dealing with um, a list of a struct which allows you to create an infinite number of these objects within the plugin setting itself um, so a perfect example of where this doesn't happen at is with the nfly's quest plugin if you've ever used the quest journal plugin the nfly has 
Um, there is a limited number of quest, um, quest parameters available to you in that, and you have extension plugins to add more. Um, like add a thousand more, I think. Um, if you play, just made the parameters be a list of the quest structure that you know, that they made for the plugin, you would need the extra the extension plugins, and the developer could just add in as many quests as they wanted to and needed to, and you wouldn't have all this extra empty um, parameters in there that you didn't use. Um, but for whatever reason, Yanfly didn't do that. <clears throat> Don't know why. Uh, again, it seems pretty, you know, seems like an obvious thing to do. So we're going to be doing that for this though. So we're going to create it. We're going to create a couple structs because we'll need two of them. We'll need one for maps, one for NPCs. And then we're going to use the map struct to create a list um, to replace our dialogue settings parameter because our dialogue list parameter because it's not going to be dialogue list anymore. We're going to be creating um, a parameter that stores the map data, um, which will be all the uh, data for each map for each NPC uh, that has all the dialogue for those NPCs. So the way that we need to define this, because we have to actually define a struct differently, it's not just a basic type. We have to create the struct first, and then we can use it as a type. Uh, but the way we do that is we start off like we normally would with a um, block comment here. Except at this point now, we need to use a tilde. That's um, shift and then the key underneath the escape key on a QWERTY keyboard. Not sure where a tilde is on non QWERTY keyboard keyboards, but you'll you should just be able to look it up and find it. Um, but you have to put that in. Then type out the word structs, and then use another tilde. And then after the second tilde, we're going to type in the name of the struct. So we're going to say map data, and then put in a colon. And then we're going to just define the parameters like we normally would. So at param um, map ID, so the ID of the current map. Uh, that we're looking at. Um, type is going to be a number. Um, and we're actually going to implement a min, a uh, min of one. And put a default of one in there. So for the next thing that we're gonna have is gonna we'll leave that for now because we need to we need to make the other struct now. Which is the NPC struct. So we're gonna do the same thing. So at param npc id uh, description um, stores the id of the npc this data is related to. Um, type is a number. Again, we're doing a min because it should be one or should be one or higher, and default will be one. Then we're gonna put in the dialog list. <laughs> All right, default to be empty list. Okay, so now, how do we go about um, adding in this as a type? Um, so what we need to do is we need to create this, uh, the other stuff for this parameter first. So param, we'll say um, npc list at description stores npc data for npcs on the current map.
um, type. So for the type, we're going to use um, the word struct, and then the name of the struct. In this case, NPC list or NPC data. And then we're going to use a, a list notation there to make it a list of those. <clears throat> so instead of having to have a whole bunch of these for each one NPC you want to add, we just make it a list so you can add as many as you need to. Um, then we're going to uh, save the default as being an empty list. Um, so this is done. Now we're going to do the same thing for this up here. Dialog list will become uh, map data. Um, so let's say a map containing um, uh, NPC dialog data per map. Type for this is going to be a struct of map data, and it's going to be a list of those. Um, we'll leave the rest of these the way they are. So now that we've changed this, we need to go and change our thing down here. We'll also then change the this to say um, map data. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and save this. And we're going to go ahead and uh, copy the file over. And we're going to load it up into the editor. And we're going to then um, configure this uh, in here as well. So let me turn on. I actually got these turned on, the scenes turned on to uh, on my stream deck now, so I should be able to. If I remember to press the buttons, I will press them to turn them on and off. Um, instead of having to go into OBS to do it. Um, so, what we're doing now is we're going to open up the plugin manager. I actually recenter this real fast. And we're going to um, hit refresh on this. And now what we're going to do is we see we have this map data thing here underneath dialog settings now. Um, wait, did we not put... We didn't. Wow, well, I forgot all about that. Okay. I forgot to put the uh, default dialog option in the dialog settings. I was looking at this and this is not part of this and I was like, wait, what's going on here? Um, let me actually just go ahead and uh, fix that real quick too. Because that might be a problem if we try and refresh to get that in there later on. There we go. Now it's in there. Cool. All right, so now we have map data. It's not a list of, of strings anymore. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to open this. And you're going to see now that we have this uh, window that opens up with a, a structure list uh, for map data, and it also has this text over here. This is the plain text version of our uh, stuff over here. And you're going to see why putting in a default in like just a note um, parameter is not the best way to do this when we uh, finish creating all this data. So we're going to go and double click on this. It's going to open up our uh, a new window here. And that's going to be the the information for our map. We already have the value 1 there, so that's fine. So we're going to double click on the list. And we're going to double click again to open up the NPC data for the list. Uh, again, that's another new window. Um, we're going to leave that as 1. And we're going to add some dialog in. Let's say uh, NPC1 one, map1 one, test dialog1. And then let me just copy that, and we're going to change that to dialog2 on the second one. Okay, hit OK there. So you can see we have our data here now. If we hit OK here, we're going to see we have our NPC data here now. We're going to go and create another one. This one's going to be NPC2. Um, so we're going to change this to NPC2 map1. And then NPC2 map1 dialog2.
Okay. So now we have our um, NPC data here. If we hit OK again, we'll have our map data. You can kind of see it here already. Now if we go to the text, we'll be able to see it a lot more easily. Look at all these. So these um, slashes are escapes. And essentially what has to happen is if you're going to use a, a character that would normally do something specific and not have it do that thing, you have to escape it basically. So since we're using this double quote here, normally a double quote means a string. So if we just had this be there and we just have this double quote here, essentially all it would be doing is making a string that has this opening curly brace in it. Well, we don't want that because we want to use this to make an object later on when you parse it. So what Arbitrary Maker does is it escapes the, um, quote, the double quote here so that it doesn't close the string. And then as you can see that happens as we go through this. Well, the deeper you get into your object tree hierarchy, the more escapes you need because you're escaping the escape so that when you parse the entire string, and the escapes are removed, you still have the escapes that you need to, to allow the um, data to be properly parsed at the lower level. Because the way you need to parse, uh, the way you parse an object that has nested objects in it is by parsing each level of the object, um, which is a really huge pain in the ass. Um, and as you can see, as we go even further down, we have all these escapes in here. And if you don't know how to do this and how many you actually will need, it can be impossible to set this up properly with like a default value in the plugin setting with a note um, property, note parameter. Um, so it's just easier to use a struct for this because uh, it will just do it for you. Um, yeah, it gets very unmanageable really fast. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and put in uh, stuff for map 2 now. Okay. So there's all of our data for this. Uh, we have these two maps now in here, and we can just add however many maps we need to have. We don't need to create a bunch of empty parameters. We just create whatever we need to in this one property. Now, I can only think the reason why Yenfly didn't do it this way is because Yenfly didn't have to deal with parsing this, which is kind of stupid because we can write some code that will parse any level, any, any amount of nesting and take this and recreate it properly in the plugin. Um, it's a very simple code to do. It does require a recursive function, so we're going to be talking about that again. But it's pretty simple once you kind of understand what's going on. It's very similar to what we did in episode 3. Um, and it will, it will parse anything you give to it, essentially. Um, given that you have it structured correctly and you aren't using some really weird syntax for things. Um, which shouldn't ever be a problem because the way the syntax are are going to be we're going to be looking at the syntax the way that the string has to be means it's either going to be a list or an object um, there's no other way to interpret the what those characters in the string mean than that um, so that shouldn't be a problem so we now have this configured that's all we had to do uh, so we're going to hit that planet in there save so let's go ahead and open this. And we're going to um, we're going to show why this is a thing we need to look at. Let me go ahead and take all this out. So we're going to put a, a breakpoint on map data here, or just underneath it. Um, Set refresh. So uh, map data. So this is what map data has in it right now. So what happens is we take our um, Tutorial. Let's actually also bring this in so you can see what this is. So this is what this looks like when you bring it in from the plugin. This is just the raw plugin data here. All this crap in here. Um, we go through and we parse it once, and we get this into a list of strings. Now, if we try and parse it again, we're going to throw an error because we're trying to parse a list now at this point. Um, so once you've parsed it once on the initial load, when it comes into the plugin, you need to stop. And then at, at that point, at some point at the beginning when the plugin is, when the, the game loads or wherever the plugin is being used at, we need to then process that into the full object. Um, but I just wanted to show you why we need to do this and the way we're doing it and why using a struct property uh, plugin uh, setting is the better way to handle this than using a note. Um, because um, 
dealing with a default setting means doing all this escaping. Um, which I guarantee you, unless you know exactly how many you need, which I don't know how many we need for this. I mean, what is this? This is like 12 or something? Um, you, you'll never get this right, and you'll spend hours trying to get it right. It's just not worth it. Um, we can just create a struct to handle it. So um, let's go ahead and actually make it uh, make the code that will process this. And we're gonna do it two different ways. We're gonna do it an easy way first, and then we're gonna do it the what I think is the right way because it's um, not gonna break very easily. And um, if you have to change something, it's not going to cause the the you have you have to re recode this uh, code to make it work properly. Um, so the first thing we have to do is we have to figure out where we want to actually process data, process this data at. Um, since we're not working with database data, this is um, just stuff that we're only using uh, once the map has been loaded because the NPCs will be calling this plugin. Um, we can do this on map load. So this is what we already have here is perfectly fine. Now, if you're working with database data and changing database data or processing based on database data, um, like you know, dealing with no tags and stuff like that, you probably want to do it after the database is loaded. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we start talking about note tags and, and how they get processed and stuff in um, episode eight, I think it'll be, because seven is going to be for the core plugin. Um, so we're going to put this here. Um, uh, we also need to have a property uh, plugin variable that will store our parsed data. So we're going to create one up here. I try to avoid just doing um, random plugin variables if I can. But if we need them, we need them. So we're going to put this up here called parsed map data. And we're just going to make that be an empty list. Um, so what this will store will be a list of all the objects we're going to create, essentially, from our map data. Um, so down here, we're going to uh, call a function. Um, we're not going to put it inside of another um, class like we did with these other ones. Like with game system, we made our own functions and we put that in the game system. We're going to create uh, essentially a function that is a utility function for the plugin. It's going to be part of the plugin, just part of the plugin. Um, and we're just going to call it as if it's uh, from the plugin specifically and not use the this command like we did with some of these other ones. Um, or any other kind of thing like we're not going to call like game system dot something. Um, so we're going to call this process map data. We're not going to pass anything through. I'm just going to do that. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and create the function definition in here. We're going to create a new block for utility functions. And then we're going to say function uh, process map data. And now we're going to do that. So all this function needs to do is, because uh, we know that once we get to this point, um, this is going to be a list of strings. Uh, we just need to loop over this, this list of strings and then do stuff with that. So all this has to do is have a loop. So we're just going to say um, uh, for uh, let data of map data um, and then we're going to say uh, parsed uh, map data dot push and now we need to create another function here so we're going to call this um, parse uh, map data and we need to pass through data into that and that's all this function has to do so this up here we'll call this function and this function is going to call our recursive function so again to redefine what a recursive function is it's a function that calls itself passes itself data and then takes that data and processes it um, again and again and again and again until you reach a point where the conditions set up inside the function aren't true anymore and it doesn't call itself again. It goes back up the, the, the each time it's called, it goes back up that call chain to where it was originally called from. And once you reach that point, the idea is that whatever you're processing has been fully compiled, whether you're aggregating values together or you're parsing data and you have now a completely parsed uh, thing that you're working with. So, 
what we need to do for this is very simple. Um, you might be thinking like, well, how do we do this? This sounds like it's a really complicated thing. Not so. Um, the first, actually, we're getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, this is going to be the other version. I want to do the, the easy version. Well, the quick and easy version that somebody might uh, suggest is easier. So how do we want to handle this now? So what's another way we can deal with this, right? We we know what these properties are, right? So we know that in this map data, we're going to have a, a string that we have to parse. Once we parse the string, we know that we're going to have a, a list of NPC data that has to be parsed. Now it's going to parse out into another list of strings that's going to be parsed into more data. And then at the very bottom, we're going to have another thing to parse that's the dialog list. So we know what all, like we know what all these are. We could just we'll just go in and do this and do it you know step by step, uh, no problem. Very simple. We'll just handle each thing as each thing we know about. We'll just handle it right. So we could do that. There's no reason we can't. So um, actually, let me let's reuse this for loop. We'll just comment this out. So. Um, First things first, we're looping through the data. We need to parse this data. So we're going to say let parsed data equal data equal JSON dot parse data. And that's going to take our string and convert it into the object. So what we're going to have at this point is we're going to have our map data struct as an object. So we're going to have a map ID and we're going to have the NPC list. NPC list is going to be, um, it's still going to be a, a stringified list meaning that's been converted to a string and we need to parse it back into a list. And then that list will contain um, stringified objects that we'll need to parse individually. So we're essentially going to be doing another for loop to redo this process again. Um, so there's, you could probably compress this a little bit, potentially, um, but I'm not going to do that because this is not a the proper solution for this. We're just going through and I'm showing you a perceived easy way that's not really the best solution. Um, it's easy, but then you're going to have a lot of problems down the road. And we're going to kind of go over why. So first thing we need to do is we need to have a... Uh, we're going to be putting this into parsed map data. So um, parsed map... Well, actually, we need to have something to store it in first because it's a list. So let new parsed data equal an object. Um, so new parsed data dot... Or rather, we can't do that because we have a space on the thing, so we have to use the bracket notation for this. So map ID um, equals uh, parsed data map ID. So that one's that one's fine because that's you know that's all there is there. Um, then we need to store uh, so let's parsed uh, let's see let um, uh, let NPC list equal um, JSON dot parse uh, parsed data NPC data right or was the list NPC list data was the uh, name of the struct all right so this is now going to be a list of strings of stringified objects so we need to go for uh, they're going to make a list called NPCs. We can call this parsed NPCs too if we want to. Well, we'll just call it NPCs for now. Then we're going to say for um, each um, uh, for let's um, NPC objects of uh, NPC list um, let parsed object equal I'm going to change this to parsed map. Equals json.parse. Um, oh. I just remembered to have that on still. Damn. Um, we didn't get too far, which is fine. Um, so we have uh, json.parse. Um, Still, I had some way to remind me that, that stuff is up somehow. <clears throat> I 
Okay. So, <clears throat> we have our MC data. So, um, what we can do here now is we can actually just um, keep parsed NPC and modify it by saying parsed NPC um, dialog list equals JSON dot parse parsed NPC dialog list. Um, the reason we have to use the bracket notation for these is because we have keys that have spaces in them. If we didn't have spaces in them, then we could just use the dot notation. Um, little interesting little tidbit for you there. Um, <clears throat> so we have that now. We have the um, I. We have the so we're essentially just parsing the object out. So parsed MC has the MC ID, and then we're taking the 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 string list for the stringified string list for the dialog list property and uh, parsing that and re essentially overriding what's in that field on that property and parsed MPC directly. Um, you could maybe probably do that with this too, but it's better not to do it in this case because we got it's a little more complex than just a simple list of strings. Um, that's why I didn't do that up here. And then we're going to say npcs.push um, and we're going to say parsed npc. And then uh, once we're done with the list we're going to say uh, new parsed data um, npc list equals NPCs. So once we're done with this, we're going to then um, say parsed map data dot push new parsed data. Let's go ahead and uh, move this over here. We're going to load up the uh, playtest and check the value in um, the uh, debugger in the console. Let's see what we get. Oh, uh, parse map data. Parse map data is not a. Okay. So here we go. So we have our data that's been parsed now. Um, everything has been parsed into what it should be. So we have we have our map data. Map ID is one. The NPC list has uh, two NPCs, and each NPC has their ID and their dialog list in their data. So this is fine. You know, you think okay, we've got it. It's doing our thing here. It's uh, parsing our data the way we want it to be parsed. Um, so, here is how easy this is to break. There you go. You have now broken your plugin code. Um, you will now have to go down here, and every time you see dialog list um, in our code down here, it has to be changed to this. Let's say you um, add another layer of um, another level, another uh, uh, object, uh, nest another nested object um, in your NPC data. Then while you're in your NPC data, you have to do another for loop to process through that NP that object data. And you have to do the same process as with these. So you're adding for each new layer of your object data, you're adding another for loop. So you're creating more nested for loops that takes longer to load. Um, so <clears throat> then on top of that, um, this becomes very unreadable because now you have to look at what you're doing with all this. Now we got all this stuff here. We're parsing data here. We're, we're parsing this here. We're looping through this and we're parsing it again. We're parsing it a third time. Actually, maybe even a fourth time. Um, using parse a fourth time and getting this and reassigning all this stuff. Um, it's very com. Yeah, you, know, you would think this is simpler, but this is actually extremely complex. So there's this is a good time to highlight complexity.
So what is, what is complexity? Well, in coding, there's two types of complexity. There's additional complexity when you you think about complexity, which is the, the idea of a complex concept, right? So you're thinking about, well, we're just gonna go like, conceptually, this is not complicated. We're essentially say for every object where we have, um, where we have something that's an, that's an object itself, we're just gonna go and we're gonna loop through that and parse it. That's really simple to understand and understand how, you know, that function should be written. Uh, in terms of actually writing the code, the the readability of that code and the um, understandability of that code, it's extremely complicated. And in, when you add on top of that the uh, performance of the code, it gets even more complex because of that. Um, because you're doing multiple for loops and for loops, you are having all these things that you're handling. Again, we could probably clean this up a little bit um, in some places, uh, but this is very, it looks simple, but it's very hard to manage and update and maintain. And there's a much simpler way to do this. That is much more readable. It's a little more complex on the conceptual side because you have to think about how to make the recursive function work which is always a huge thing. You know, like, trying to figure out how recursive functions work is a pain in the ass. But once you do that and you get past that hurdle, they usually are the best way to handle processing nested data. So um, we're gonna say goodbye to this because this is all uh, not what we need to do. It's all in, uh, it's all, uh, in my opinion, it's a, a all you know, substandard implementation. Um, it's a much better way to do this. So we're gonna have this function we're gonna call called parsed map data, or parse map data. So function parse map data. It's gonna take in a string to parse. So data string. All right. So. What do we need to do with this function? Well, we need to parse the string first of all. So we're gonna say let data equal uh, json.parse data string. And then we need to loop over this uh, parsed string. So um, let's think about this here now. So what what kinds of things do we need to deal with here? You know, what what would this be? Because determining we have to determine what type of loop we need to use, right? Well, we know that um, <clears throat> in most cases we're going to have uh, with this stuff we're going to have a um, a list of some kind or an object because those are the only real things that you can parse. So, what's the best way to handle both those cases? Well, it's a for in loop. The reason a for in loop is the best way is because for of doesn't work for an object, for in works for a list uh, as well as an object. So it's the better answer here. So we're going to say for um, let key in data, and then we're going to uh, essentially get a value. So let value equal um, data key. Okay. All right. So. We have our <clears throat> data parsed. We're getting a value based on the key we're looping through. So what do we do now? Well, now we need to say, well, is the thing we're looking at something we need to parse? Is it a, a parsable object that's still in a string form or is it not? Um, so how do we deal with that, right? <clears throat> how, do we, how do we handle checking that? Well, we could use regex. We're not gonna do that though, because that's compli com complicated and we wanna not do that for the moment. Um, we could do some string operations. Um, there's a bunch of ones that could apply here, um, but some of them are some of them aren't really as good as others, and we really don't need anything too fancy for this. Um, instead, what we're going to say is, well, we know that the beginning of a string is a certain way for certain things, and if it's an object that we can parse, so if it's a list or a J JavaScript object, we're going to have specific things we're looking at, right? Um, a list is always going to start with an open bracket followed by um, a uh, quotation mark because that's going to be the first item in there. Um, 
if it's like, you know, a list of something. I feel like a list of objects or something like that. It's gonna have a, a thing there. Um, if it's a list of IDs, there, and yeah, if it's a list of numbers, there's maybe a problem there we'll have to deal with. But in this case, we don't really care about that because we don't have a list of IDs. So for the, the data that we have and that we're expecting, this will work. We'll have to look at that again if we, might be something that is interesting to look into um, on your own or we'll do something in the next video to, next episode to look at that <clears throat> and see what happens. Because funnily enough, we're gonna actually run into that situation because we're gonna be adding in a list of values in the next video to further en enhance and expand this plugin. Um, episode six but for now this should be fine so what we're gonna use we're gonna use substring we talked about that a bit earlier i believe i think we did anyway um i might be thinking of like one of the other times i've tried to record this so what a substring is is it's a string function that allows you to say that from uh this point in a string to uh, and then this many characters after that um i want to pull that out as its own thing so that's probably a good point. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure we haven't talked about this yet. I think that wasn't one of the other ones. Um, so let's talk about a string. Let's talk about strings for a second. Um, I glossed over a huge thing about strings back when we talked about them in episode three. And that is that they're actually not as simple as I had you believe. Um, they're actually uh, a, a string is a, is a list. It's a list of characters. Um, where while you can you know, use strings as a proper type, you can also deal with them as if they're a list. Like for example, if I wanted to, I could say um, console.log um, test uh, two. So what this should print out is the E, uh, or no, it should be the L, that's uh, character three. Yeah, so we have the L down here now. Um, so you can access a, a string as you would a list because it's just a list of characters. Um, so what's what uh, what um, string uh, uh, string substring does is it lets you pull out a certain number of characters. So we say test dot substring got the dot and then the first. Uh, property of substring is the index you want to start from. So again, since a string is a list, the lists have index. You're looking for a specific index you want to start pulling the string, your, your substring from. We're going to say zero because we want to start from the beginning here. Um, and then we're going to say, let's say four characters, right? Um, so based on what I've said so far about this, what do you think we're going to get out of the string when we do this? Uh, again, we're starting from zero, so the first element, so the first character and then four characters after that. Yeah, we got the hell out of Hello World. Um, so we're gonna use that in what we're doing here. These other things here, split and splice. Um, uh, do I, we talked about this, didn't we, for plugin commands? I'm pretty sure we did. No, we never went back and talked about this, did we? I think I mentioned it and we never did. If I did, I'll cut this part out. Um, but another way you can handle um, plugin commands is by using sp split and splice. Um, uh, splits are used to <clears throat> um, essentially take a particular character and say, wherever you find this character in a string, I want to create, um, a, essentially create an, an array element, a list element for that particular point up until the character we're splitting on. So like for example, for hello world, we're going to get hello, then world, then one, four, and seven, all as individual um, list elements um, and the test parts because we're splitting on spaces. Um, and then we can take splice, which is a list pro a list function. And what splice does is it lets you say that from this particular element for this number of elements after it, I'm going to pull those out into a separate list. So it's kind of like substring for but for um, lists where you can pull out specific parts of a of a um, uh, an array they want to use. In this case, what we're doing is we're pulling out the one, four, and the seven from the test parts, and we're storing that in a property called IDs, and that's what's getting printed out down here. 
So you kind of can see what we can do with that now. Like we have the plugin command. We know that we're using spaces to split to set uh, separate out each part of it. We can um, uh, when we do a split on the spaces, we know how many elements we're going to have up until where the actual parameters are passing through our app because we know that um, at certain points, you know, where the parameters are going to show up at because we know the structure of the string, the command string. And so we can either just go in and pull out the specific array element, um, or we can pull out um, a, a range of elements with splice to get all the properties we need um, instead of using regex. So this is also a valid way to handle dealing with plugin commands. Um, but I still think regex is easier to deal with. Um, that's what substring split and splice are. So what we're going to do here, though, is, is we're going to use substring to look at the value, uh, part of the value. So if um, value.substring uh, 0 to 2. Um, so starting on element 0 to the second character. Um, if that equals um, a open, open square brackets with a uh, quotation mark or If value dot substring zero two equals equals curly brace with a double quotes, then uh, what we're going to want to do with this now is we're going to re we want to call uh, parse map data again. So what we're going to do is we're going to say data key equals. Um, parse map data. Now we're going to pass through um, the value. So what this is going to do is, is every time we find something we can parse, we're going to essentially call the function again, pass to the value, and the value will go through the process, get parsed. Um, we'll go through the the keys, the the data, the prop the property data of that object. If there's anything in there that has to be parsed, it'll get parsed, we'll go through the process again, and again and again until we get to the point where this isn't true anymore, where we reach a point where there's nothing to parse. Um, then each step we're going to return data, and it's going to overwrite what's in data key um, while we're inside the original for loop. It's going to overwrite what's in data key, so we're going to update what's there, and then return data, and it's going to update what's in that data key and what's in that data key, etc. until we come back up to the top level where we originally ran, uh, called this from and where the, the original for loop is running from. Um, and then that's going to, once this is done, essentially parse all the data and return the entire parsed object back to our um, process map data and it's going to be put into our parsed map data list as a fully parsed object. Um, so again, Let's go over this one more time because that was a little bit went pretty quick. That's probably kind of confusing. So, um, what's going to happen here is we're going to take uh, from this function we're passing in to parse map data a string um, that's an object that's been stringified. Um, we're going to parse that string into an object, and then we're going to loop through the data in that object. If at any point during that process we find a value in the object that is a string an object string that's been turned stringified um, we're going to parse that object string back into an object then we're going to do another loop through that object looking through all its data find anything that's an object that we need to parse we're going to call parsed map data again we're going to parse that string etc etc until we reach a point where there are no more objects to parse at that point what's going to happen is we're going to essentially go back up all the different times we call the function and each step, the data that's returned is going to be another layer of the object um, chain that's been, you know, the object um, nest, object tree, that's been uh, parsed. And so we're going to have parse data, return for parse data, return uh, parse data, return parse data, return parse data, until we get back up to the initial, initial parse map data call. Because remember, we're calling this multiple times 
from within itself, so we're going back up each step to back to where we originally called it from. And once we get to that point, what's going to end up happening is that um, at each step, the data that we sent in to get parsed is going to be replaced with the parsed data. So that when we get down to this return down here, this data, which was originally storing a um, parsed string that had other par parsable objects in it, is going to have all the parsed data um, fully structured properly and all that kind of stuff. 